Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for attending our webinar tonight on tips and tricks for the preschool parent. My name is Lori, and I work for the TheraPlay family of companies and children's therapy centers. Uh, and we are very excited um, to talk to you tonight about our topic. I'm responsible for community outreach and education and fun things like this. So I would really like to introduce our speaker tonight, who is Darcy Scheffler. And Darcy um, is our center manager in our Springfield location. And she is also a very passionate occupational therapist that has been working for the Children's Therapy Centers, or CTC as we like to call ourselves, for over 17 years. And she graduated with an OT degree from Quinnipiac University and has been practicing as a pediatric occupational therapist since 1999 in a variety of settings, including schools, home-based services, and also in our outpatient centers where she currently is now and managing our Springfield location. So Darcy comes to us with tons of experience and we're so excited to have her um, tonight. And thank you, Darcy. And thanks to everyone again for participating. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, just gonna let you know this is my first time doing this without seeing human faces so this is a little strange for me so i would encourage anybody to please ask questions and use the chat box um lori and lauren are kind of moderating for me and they'll let me know if there's a question that comes in so please feel free to ask questions um so that i can provide as much information for you as possible um the concept behind this is i really wanted to talk to parents. Um, you guys have been kind of getting down and dirty this year, uh, especially really seeing your kids, um, helping them through school, seeing everything that's um, being expected of them, maybe not knowing if what you're seeing is what you should be seeing, maybe having some questions and not having somebody to ask. So I wanted to kind of give you some insights on things that as an occupational therapist, we would look at as possible red flags, some things that you can do at home. And then if need be, if you need to seek out help, where you would go and when it would be appropriate to seek out help. So um, feel free to type in any questions as we go and we will jump in and get started. Um, so we're gonna start out by talking about what is OT. Um, occupational therapy in general is um, a form of therapy that helps people with any daily activities. When it comes to preschool kids, we're talking about how are their fine motor skills developing? How is their sensory processing? How are their visual motor and visual perceptual skills developing? How are they moving about the environment and being able to play on playgrounds and use their motor planning skills? How are their muscles, their core strength and stability muscles working? Are they able to um, dress themselves and start taking care of themselves and brush their teeth and use um, utensils to eat? Um, and then what are their social skills like? Are they playing correctly and appropriately? Are they interacting with kids appropriately? Obviously this year has posed some unique challenges for social skills. Um, so, you know, any questions you might have about that? I know in the Virginia area where I am, um, kids are starting to go back to school this month um, more than they had been before. So, um, we'll be kind of facing that along with you guys and helping along with you guys if there are needs. So that's what occupational therapy is. And what we're gonna do is highlight some of these areas and really dig into them. So first thing we're gonna talk about is sensory processing. What is sensory processing? Um, sensory processing is taking all eight senses. And yes, there are eight of them. I know you guys are probably commonly um, knowledgeable about five of them, but there are eight senses and we'll go through those. Um, and using all those eight senses to receive information from within our body, as well as the environment around us, 
filtering out things that are important that give us information about safety or how to move our body or to discriminate between different types of input. Um, one of the really important things about sensory processing is you have to have efficient sensory processing in order to regulate your body, be calm, be attentive, and be able to learn. So it's really important when we're thinking about preschoolers um, that, that we really need to look at these things. And this is kind of the baseline um, where sensory comes in and where OT kind of can give some strategies to say, is, is this what's happening that's causing difficulty at circle time or difficulty with eating or, or things like that? So what are the eight senses that we talk about? We have sense of touch, our tactile processing. Um, so our sense of touch tells us how things feel with our hands, within our mouth, different textures. We know the difference between um, a mother stroking a baby and calming them versus something sharp poking our skin. We can tell if the bath water is hot or it's safe for us to get in. A baby can identify if they have a dirty diaper. Um, when, when tactile processing might be overwhelming for a child, it might be that a tag in their shirt or a seam on their socks might feel like a hundred different flies attacking them at once that they can't brush off or itch away. So sometimes we might see this adverse reaction that's an oversensitivity to this tactile input. Um, Olfaction is our sense of smell. Um, it helps us know if something is cooking versus something burning. So that's a big safety regulator. Um, both olfaction and gustation, our sense of taste, also tell us if things are spoiled or fresh. Um, if we're gagging because of a smell or a taste or the way something feels in our mouth, that would be um, an indicator of something maybe not processing correctly, if we can't eat certain foods because we're gagging or vomiting, um, that would obviously be something that would be a red flag for us in sensory processing. Um, another sense is our sense of vision or how we see. Um, it helps us identify as we're looking about our environment if a step we need to lift our foot up really high to step up on a step, or if it's just a shallow step and we can just take a little step up. Um, if there's a change in surface, it helps us figure out how to modify our gait pattern so we don't trip or fall. Uh, it helps us identify spatial relations, where things are within our environment, putting puzzles together. Um, it tells us if we're going to sit down, if we see a hard bench versus a soft, pillow cushion, how we're going to modify our body to sit correctly on that surface. Um, moving on to the auditory sense, our sense of hearing. Uh, it helps us distinguish between voices, noises, alarms, or sirens. It helps us identify praise versus disappointment, tone of voice versus the actual words that are being said, which will really help with our social skill development. It also helps us filter out surrounding sounds, filter out the teacher talking and the instructions she's giving from the rumpling, crumpling paper next to us. And if we don't have efficient uh, sensory processing in the auditory realm, we may not be able to filter that out and therefore we might miss important information. We may not be able to follow directions or sequence the directions that we're getting for a multi-step activity. We might just hear part of it. So that's part of the auditory sense. And then come the three senses that you may not be as aware of. So um, our vestibular sense is our sense of balance and movement through space. Um, our vestibular sense gives our brain information or our central nervous system information from receptors that are within our inner ear. There's um, some canals in our inner ear, and then when fluid moves through those canals, it sends our central nervous system information, and it tells our body how to move or where we are in space. Um, so this is a really hard one to kind of understand. So um, what I like to uh, give as an analogy, there are a few common things that we all have experienced that 
when you're falling asleep and you feel like you just dropped and you open your eyes to make sure you know where you are, that you're still in bed. Uh, when you step off a treadmill and you feel like your body is still moving, that's your vestibular sense. And you have to like ground yourself to know, oh, my feet are flat on an unmoving surface now. Um, so that's the vestibular sense. If you have an ear infection and you feel like your head is a little dizzy, that's the vestibular sense. Um, and then proprioception is how your body, where your body is in space. So vestibular is our body moving through space and proprioception is where are we currently in space. Um, our central nervous system gets information through our muscles and joints to tell us about uh, proprioception. Um, proprioception allows us to know how much force to apply when I am cutting through an apple versus cutting through a piece of bread. If I am picking up a feather versus a can of soup. Uh, it also lets us know where our body is without looking at something. So if you close your eyes right now and picture your body, are your legs crossed? Are your hands sitting on a table? Are you holding a pencil? You know that without looking at it. And that's your proprioceptive system working and telling your body, okay, I know where my body is. We have some children who don't have that ability, who really rely on their eyes to teach them how to use their hands, who might be able to button if their button is in front of them, but they can't button their pants because they can't quite see it. So that might be something that we're looking at if there's challenges with proprioception. And then the last sense that I want to talk about is interoception. Interoception are the feelings that we feel from within our bodies. So it's our hunger and satiation, our thirst, our urge to need to use the restroom, sleep regulation. Those are interoceptive um, sensations. Our, our emotions are related to interoception. So when we talk about sensory processing, we talk about either these senses are processing things at a just right level. We could be over responsive to some of these senses. We could be under responsive or we could be seeking out these senses. And if any of that is not functioning well together, we can just be very dysregulated and have difficulty modulating our reactions to these things and therefore not functioning well in our daily lives. So moving on, we've talked about a few red flags as I was going through these, but here are some more things that you may see um, with kids that have difficulty with sensory processing. They may have a poor tolerance for messy play. They might not want to get into crafts or finger paint, or if a drop of water or food gets on their shirt, they have to take off their shirt or change their shirt. Um, or on the flip side, they may be overly messy and not even realize they have yogurt all over their face and need to wipe their face. Um, kids with um, sensory processing difficulties, as I mentioned before, might have a very hard time eating. They may have a very limited diet and be unable to eat certain textures or gag often. Um, they might have difficulty with teeth brushing or gag with teeth brushing. They might have difficulty tolerating weather appropriate clothing. So either short sleeves or long sleeves might bother them. Seams and socks or tags that we talked about before. They may have sleep difficulties. Uh, once they get past the, the infant stages, they may still be mouthing objects or toys that they shouldn't be putting in their mouth, biting on the, their clothing or other objects. You might see toe walking. Toe walking is not a normal gait pattern that we want to see in children because it can affect uh, bone and tendon development. It can cause restriction in muscles. So we wanna look at that. If, if you're walking on your toes, your entire body weight is going through those tiny little joints in your feet. So you're getting a lot of that proprioceptive input. So that might be an indicator. That's something we look out for. Children who have sensory processing difficulties often have difficulty with social skills. Um, and we're gonna talk about social skills in more depth later, um, but that's something we see because if we can't 
handle what's going on in our environment or we don't know where our body is in our environment, it's going to impact how we interact with our peers. Um, we might have difficulty following directions. We had talked about auditory information and processing that information. You might see clumsiness or bumping into objects or leaning on objects in the environment. Um, sometimes it can almost look like they're lazy, but it might just be that they need some extra support because their body doesn't know where it is. It's not grounded uh, in space. That proprioceptive system is not working efficiently. They might have difficulty standing in line or standing still for any periods of time. Children uh, sometimes might speak too loudly or speak too quietly. They have diff difficulty regulating that tone of voice, discriminating when it's appropriate to have a loud voice versus a quiet voice. They might have a fear of heights. Um, and we're gonna talk about motor planning in a little bit. Um, so sometimes these things may overlap, but um, there, if you have difficulty with your vestibular processing and you have difficulty moving in space, Think about how challenging it might be if you're up on a playground equipment and you look down and you don't know how to move your body to get down from there. That's really scary to you. Um, there might be a resistance to explore the environment or play on the playground, like I was just saying. Um, there might be a decreased sensation of pain or temperature. This is something we hear a lot from families that come seeking our help is that their child doesn't react to pain. They might get a big walk on the head and they're just moving about their business. Or they might be overly sensitive to pain and just the brush of um, somebody walking by them sent them um, into a panic situation or they overreacted in some way to that. Um, children uh, oftentimes may fall or bump into objects in the environment, not be able to kind of uh, walk through a store without touching things or bumping into things. They may use too much force when they're coloring or pushing a puzzle piece in. They might just keep pushing too hard. We also often see um, an increased anxiety level in children that have sensory processing difficulties because, again, they can't interpret what's going on around them, and so they're always kind of in defense mode. So what do we do about it? What do we do with these um, concerns we have. Oh, before I move on to that, um, I also wanted to just point out that behavior issues are not sensory issues. We oftentimes um, get parents coming to us for concerns about behavior, and behavior is something that we all do. If we're hungry, we go to the refrigerator and we get food. That is a behavior. If a task is hard for us, we might procrastinate or avoid it. That is a behavior. So it's really important that as professionals, we look at why a behavior is happening and figure out if it is related to a sensory issues. Oftentimes, we have a sensory issue, so behaviors develop. Like I said, we might be in defense mode all the time and, and we can't handle our environment. So we might have a behavioral reaction to a sensory problem. But just because there's a behavioral issue does not mean it's because of a sensory problem. So like I said, what do we do about this? Well, we wanna think about seating choices. As kids go back to school, if they have difficulty with auditory processing or sitting on the floor for a long period of time, maybe we wanna think about some other options for circle time. Maybe that they can sit in a chair with a supportive back or some supportive sides in it. Maybe they can play games at a table versus sitting on the floor if their body is moving around too much. Sometimes if, if your child is one of those children that get overwhelmed very easily by input, having a cool out corner or a chill out corner is a great place to, to regulate and come back to what we call homeostasis or that just right feeling. Um, so you can make, you can put up a tent in a corner of your house with a beanbag chair, some cuddly uh, stuffed animals. And what's really important about this is it's not punitive. This is not time out. This is, hey, your body looks like it needs a little break. It looks like your body is going too fast right now or might be having, there might be too much noise going on. Let's go to our cool out corner and take a break. 
Um, so that's a really important difference from a timeout. And again, this isn't a behavior that we're trying to change because they're acting out. It's that they need a tool to help them. And that's what the cool out corner is. Um, visual cues like picture schedules and reward systems. I'm going to show you some examples of some visual cues in a few minutes. Um, Decreased visual stimulation and distraction. So as your child goes back to school, again, if they're a child that gets overwhelmed by visual input, thinking about how much is going on around them. Or if they're working at home, if they're still doing um, schooling online, maybe setting them up in an area that's not so distracting, that their siblings aren't running around, where they're facing a wall, or you can even set up like a little carol with some folders around their desk if they're trying to listen to a story time online. Um, structured movement breaks are a great tool for getting some of that vestibular and proprioceptive input. Now, a structured movement break is a really important tool. It's not just run around play time. Um, we try to use play as much as possible in our therapy session. So what looks like play is oftentimes very therapeutic. So instead of just saying, okay, go take a break while I get ready for the next activity, it's guided movement. We're gonna try to incorporate some sort of cognitive element. We're gonna maybe hit a balloon back and forth or jump on a trampoline while we're naming animals. Or maybe we're gonna do a log roll down the hallway while we give a high five, and at the same time we give a high five, we say one of our favorite characters from a TV show. Um, we want to work on, we're going to do it 10 times so that they know how many times, and then we're going to go back to an activity that we took a break from or transition to the next activity. So it's really important that there's structure around those movement breaks so that it doesn't in itself become overwhelming and dysregulating. Sometimes the use of vibrate, vibratory toys or pillows is really helpful. Um, for circle time, we've often used um, pillows that children can sit on and they vibrate when you sit on them. And that gives that proprioceptive input through their leg muscles. Um, there are vibratory toys out there. This is a bug that you push his nose and he buzzes. And that can get rubbed on arms or backs. Some kids put it on their head. Some kids put it right up to their TMJ joint here, which gives a lot of input through the jaw and actually through the rest of their body. So vibratory toys are a great way of organizing and getting some sensory input. There are even um, vibratory pens that don't actually shake the writing, but can give input if your child is having a hard time um, holding a pencil. And we're gonna talk about fine motor skills in a little bit, but it gives input to the hand. Um, teaching regulation, how do we regulate once we get overwhelmed, once we, if we're having a low day and we need to raise our energy level? Um, I'm going to show you in a few minutes some visuals on how to teach regulation. Um, and then most importantly, especially in preschool, we want to use sensory experiences whenever possible as a teaching tool. If we're starting to work on drawing shapes or letters, we want to try to do that in sensory mediums. Let's draw it in sand or salt that you sprinkle on a cookie tray. Um, let's use shaving cream and draw our letters or shapes in that. We can use jello jigglers and cookie cutters to cut out shapes. Um, we can talk about the different senses that we touch when we're in a fabric store or um, when we're walking through the grocery store or Target. Um, we can jump to name things. If we're working on number identification or letter identification, we can spread index cards around the floor and let's jump to the letter B or let's jump to the number three. Um, spinning and stopping games or moving and stopping games are a great way to work on impulse control and regulation. And then your good old sensory bins. Throw some rice in a big bin, some dried beans in a big bin. I love using, especially for kids who have difficulty with feeding cooked foods and using those in sensory bins like ramen noodles, hiding puzzle pieces or Legos in it for them to 
dig through and discriminate the difference in, in textures and find those Legos to build something. So those are all tips and tricks that you can do right at home. To show you some of those visual cues, when we're, talk, when we're talking about regulation and teaching regulation, one of the tools we use is talking about a just right body. And sometimes we use the analogy of a balloon. So this yellow balloon is just right. It has just the right amount of air. It's floating, we can bounce it back and forth. And I'll often do this with my children so they can experience what just right feels like. Our bodies, when they're just right, are just right. They're ready to learn, they're listening, they're moving at the right speed. If our bodies are too low, which some of our sensory kids are just very slow and low, they may appear more sedentary, they may need more action to get their bodies going, that would be a deflated balloon. So we can show them it just kind of flops there, it lies there. If we pick it up, it flops down. So they might be your kids that are slouching more, that need more supportive devices to help them, that might need some jumping to alert them if they're gonna be engaging in a challenging activity. And then you've got this broken balloon here. That's when our bodies are too much. Our bodies have too much air in them, they're moving around, they're just gonna burst. And so that is our broken balloon. Um, and the kids really understand that analogy and we'll burst a balloon and what happens? Oh my gosh, it startles everybody. It's unexpected. If our bodies are too much, what do our peers think? They're, they don't know how to handle that. Our teachers don't know how to handle that. So that's a great analogy. The one next to the balloons is a remote control. All the kids know how to use remote controls, right? So play is our just right mode. Our bodies are just right. They know what's going on. We're learning, we're listening, we're following directions. Our bodies are calm. Pause might happen if we need to change directions. It might happen if we need to reverse or go back, which would be our rewind button. Let's say we might have moved too fast. Let's pause, let's think, and let's try again. Let's rewind, play, and try again. And fast forward are those that are going too fast, who have so much energy and they're bouncing off the walls, they're on fast forward. We need to pause. And then our stop is when we're being unsafe. If we're being unsafe or our impulsivity is impacting somebody else, um, that's when we need to stop. We may not rewind, we might just change what we're doing. We might play in a different direction, change our channel. Um, so that's a remote control analogy. And these are simple, easy things. You can make it on the computer. You can cut out paper and laminate it, which are what these are. Um, the stoplight, that's pretty straightforward. Our green is our go. It's the just right speed. Um, some of our kids like to be backseat drivers and they'll monitor how fast we're going in our car. Um, so we can help them monitor how fast their speed is going. Um, our yellow is slow down, it's caution, it's, hey, we might need to stop, let's, let's maybe adjust what we're doing. And then again, stop is, we need to stop, we need to change what we're doing, we need to just put the brakes on. This um, cardboard over here is what I call, it. it's called a token reward system. So this is more of a strategy that we use to let kids know that they're on the right track, they're doing the right things. So typically within a session or an activity or a day, it depends on your child, um, they can earn five cars. It could be their favorite character, it could be marbles in a jar, it can be anything. Um, the concept is that it's motivating to them. And so the cars typically are on a Velcro strip on the back. And they are given at the will of the adult when they catch the child doing something that is what is a desired action. So Johnny, I really like how you stayed in your chair the whole time Miss, Miss Darcy was reading that story. You get a car. Or Sally, I really like that just right voice you used when you asked your question. It wasn't too loud, it was just right, you get a car. So these are ways that you can reinforce the positives. Um, this is not meant to be punitive. It is not, I'm gonna take away a car if you use a loud voice. 
it is only for the positives. And if we get the five, we earn whatever reward was preset. You get time to read a book with mommy, or you get to play a game with daddy, or whatever it is. Um, but it's important that the child know ahead of time what their reward is, and that, again, if we don't earn the reward, we don't make a big deal about it. We just say, let's try again tomorrow, or let's try again next time. Um, I also, and I didn't put this on the slide, but I also do have an example of a visual schedule. I don't know if you guys can see that. But this is a schedule of um, a month. Now, a month might be too much. You might need to do a visual schedule throughout the day. But this shows this little girl that she's got speech therapy with Miss Robin on Mondays. She's got Miss Darcy on Fridays. She's got library or school on these days. And it gives her an example of what is needed and what's expected of her that day. Again, sometimes using the sense of vision can be very calming and organizing. For kids that are very anxious and have difficulty with transitions, having pictures to explain what's going to happen throughout the day can be really useful and helpful. So we are going to move on to the next topic. I know that was a lot about sensory. I think it's a really important one that OT focuses on a lot. Um, again, ask questions anytime you have them throughout. I will try to save time at the end as well. Um, but we're going to move on to motor planning unless there are any questions. So motor planning, we um, talk about the word praxis. Praxis is motor planning. And that is our ability to plan, sequence, execute that sequence, and adapt a motor plan. So I like to think about driving a car. The first time your first learners permit days when you're learning to drive a car. Um, you get all excited, you get in the car. Okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna put the key in, I'm gonna turn the key, and then I'm gonna pull out of the parking spot. That's the sequence, right? Then you execute that sequence and you're like, oh my gosh, I slammed on the gas and I jerked out of that parking spot, right? So we have to adapt that motor plan and we have to let up on the gas and push more gently or step on that brake, right? So that's that adaptation of motor plan. So as children are learning and adapting their motor plans, they're getting better at them. Now we drive to the grocery store, we're talking to the kids in the back seat, the radio's on, and we don't even remember making the turns that were necessary to get to the grocery store. So we've learned that motor plan, it's ingrained in us, it's part of motor memory. Um, children that have difficulty with motor planning, they're gonna need a lot of help to work through how to either plan, sequence, execute, adapt, or all of those components to help their bodies move. So let's look at some red flags. So red flags for motor planning issues, like we talked about in sensory processing, they may be scared to try new motor activities. They may not even want to try to ride a bike. They don't know how to do it. They don't know how to sequence it. It might just be really overwhelming to them. Um, they may be unable to finger count. Oftentimes, kids that have motor planning difficulties, and I know you guys are gonna all try this with your kid. This doesn't diagnose them with a motor planning difficulty, but um, ask your child to give you a thumbs up and let's see how many of them go like this. That's a big one. <laughs> we get these all the time instead of a thumbs up. Um, but figuring out how to count to three and push our fingers down, two, um, give a thumbs up, give an okay. Um, those are all motor plans for our hands. Um, children who are very accident prone would be motor planning red flags. Uh, children who are unable to dress themselves in preschool, they should be able to dress themselves pretty well by themselves. Um, they might get things backwards or need help with some fasteners, but they should be able to get their clothes on and off. Um, we talked about riding a bike, unable to pedal and steer at the same time. Um, that would be an indicator of, of a possible red flag. Um, children who have difficulty with learning to draw shapes and letters. Um, children who have difficulty on playground equipment or get stuck. Oftentimes kids will climb up but not know how to get down. Um, Children who talk themselves through motor plans, who need to 
say it out loud. That's actually one of the tools we teach children is we'll teach them motor scripts to help them with challenging motor plans. Um, and again, children with higher anxiety, if you don't know how to move through the environment, you might have some more anxiety. So what are some ideas to help kids with motor planning? Fun games, again, all we do in occupational therapy is play. So Simon Says games. Now there's so many ways to play Simon Says. When you first start working on Simon Says with a child that has motor planning issues, you're gonna model for them. You're gonna use that visual sense. Put your fingers on your nose, put your fingers on your head. Then you might just use the verbal cues. Simon says, touch your nose. Simon says, touch your head. Then the third step might be you do something different. Simon says, touch your nose. Simon says, touch your eyes. So you're doing something different to trick their visual system so they're listening and figuring out how to move their body. Obstacle courses are a great way to mark on motor planning. They can involve so anything that you can be creative enough to do. Um, different surfaces, pillows. One of my favorite ways to do an obstacle course is give a child some um, words to create their own obstacle course. So I'll tell them, we're gonna create an obstacle course and you have to find something we can go under, something we can go over, something we can go through, and something we can go around. And they have to identify what objects in the environment they can use for that. They have to set it up in a sequence. They have to plan it. And then you can have them adapt their plan and say, okay, now let's do it in reverse or let's do step two first. And you can help them with that adaptation piece. Sequencing games are great. Any board games that have sequencing is great. Um, but there are also some gross motor games or motor games you can use with your body. Um, it's Dr. Seuss's birthday today. There's a Dr. Seuss game called I Think I Can, which has some great motor planning. There's a cranium game called Hullabaloo that tells a child, spin to a circle, sit down on a square, things like that. Um, having your child to talk you out of being stuck. If they're one of those children that don't know how to motor plan out of something, have them talk you through it. You climb to the top of the playground and say, oh my goodness, I don't know what to do. Help me. What do I do first? Do I move my hand? Where should I move my foot? How far do I move it? And have them talk you through it and then have them climb up and see if they can motor plan through it. One of the things that I think as parents and adults we do with children with motor planning is we, we move them. And that's great, that's helpful in the moment, but it's not teaching them the motor plan. So we wanna do less hand over hand help and more teaching them how to move their own body to get dressed and do things. Um, animal walks and silly walks are a great way to work on motor planning and thinking about how does an elephant move? What does a snake do? He's on his belly. Uh, an elephant has a trunk. How do we make a trunk? What could we pretend is our trunk? And having them plan that and sequence that. Charades are great. Um, having them pretend they're reading a book, having them pretend they're cooking. What does it look like when you open a door? having them think about those motor plans without letting them use a piece of equipment to actually hold a bowl and stir. They're just pretending to do it. That's really challenging for kids with motor planning difficulty. Using adverbs and hiding things around the house. First, I want you to go get the thing that's behind the chair and then get the toy that's under the coffee table. Um, and then scavenger hunts. Scavenger hunts are a great way to work on motor planning and moving throughout space. So those are some great tips for motor planning at home. So now we'll keep going and we'll move on to fine motor skills. Fine motor skills are those skills that are operated by the smaller muscles of our body, our hands, our eyes, our mouth. So it's anything that we're using our hands with, our eye-hand coordination, our oral skills like chewing, biting, licking. So what are some fine motor red flags we might see in a preschool kid? We might see difficulty holding or operating crayons or markers. 
We might see difficulty feeding with utensils or controlling an open cup, spilling often, difficulty with opening containers that they should be able to open at this age. Um, poor use of two hands together. We'll see children who are trying to put potato pieces in with one hand but not holding the potato head with their other hand. That's called bilateral coordination, using two hands together or two parts of your body together. We might see children with um, fine motor difficulties who use their whole hand or palm versus their fingers to manipulate items. We might see them pushing a puzzle piece in with their palm versus the knob holding the knob or manipulating the actual piece with their fingertips. Um, we might see them grabbing food and eating it like this with their palm versus using a pincer grasp and picking up the food. Um, children, again, who have difficulty completing age-appropriate dressing. Um, we've got lots of easy ways to get dressed now. A lot of kids don't have buttons on their clothing anymore. Everything's elastic or Velcro. Um, so a lot of times those skills don't develop unless we teach them. So teaching your child getting some of those button toys is a great thing to do. Children that have difficulty staying in their seat. Now, our trunk muscles are not so much fine motor muscles, but they really contribute to fine motor development. Um, one of the main uh, theories behind fine motor, it's not even a theory, it's a foundation, behind fine motor development is you have to have a stable base, a stable uh, support to be able to control those movements that you need your fine motor skills for. So if our trunk is all wiggly and we don't have good core stability and we're, and we're falling out of our chair or our sensory system is so disrupted that we're moving around all the time, how can we ex be expected to be able to control our hands for our fine motor skills, for cutting, for drawing? How can we be con uh, controlling our mouth for efficient eating if we're falling out of our chair? Um, and then difficulty finding objects in a busy environment. This goes to your eye muscles. Are we able to scan? Are we able to have our eyes jump from object to object? Are we able to find things within a drawer or within our closet? So what can we do at home about this? Um, OTs, we, we've got a lot of tricks. We've got lots of them. So one of our favorites are alligator fingers or baby shark fingers. All of the kids now know what baby shark is. Um, and so they can make the baby shark. So oftentimes we'll teach them to make a fist and then to push out their fingers to make a baby shark. One of the biggest issues that children have with fine motor development is they haven't learned how to separate their two sides of your hand. So you've got um, the one side of your hand with your thumb and your pointer finger and your middle finger too. And then you've got your other side of your hand with your um, other, three fin other two fingers. Usually for a pincer grasp, these three fingers are down and we're pinching, okay? When you're holding a pencil, a mature grasp has your thumb and your first finger holding the pencil and it's resting against that third finger. So that third finger is kind of flexed, but supportive, okay? So that's what a mature grasp looks like, what we expect a five and a six-year-old's grasp to look like. But in preschool, we should be able to separate the two sides of our hand and do alligator fingers or baby shark fingers. So one thing I like to do is take a little baby sock and you can draw an alligator or a shark on it and cut two holes in it and make a baby shark or an alligator and he can pick things up. So that's a little alligator sock and that's an easy thing to make at home. We can use um, different grips, and there are all sorts of different grips out there. Um, you know, I have some to show. These are ones that I might use for some kids that are older preschoolers, um, definitely not your newer preschoolers, um, and you might try them out. They're on Amazon. There are different kinds of grips out there for different types of children, different needs. Um, and OT can definitely direct you if you're not sure which grip is correct for your child. We use tweezers and tongs a lot in OT. So here's an example of some tweezers or children's chopsticks. Um, we like to put little tape marks on them for them to know where their two fingers go. 
It's a great way to work on that separation of the sides of the hand. And you can pick up marbles. You can move game pieces along Candyland with it. You can pick up uh, popcorn or uh, goldfish and eat them that, that way. Um, you can play almost any game with tweezers or tongs. Um, eyedroppers are a great thing to use at home. You can use them with food coloring. If it snows again, which hopefully we won't have any more snow this year, um, you can make what I call tie-dye snow and use some food coloring with eyedroppers and put it in the snow and make different colors. Um, we often will color on a vertical or slanted surface or an easel or the wall. So what we do is we would start by taking a coloring page or a piece of paper and taping it to the wall and having the child draw on it. That's going to work on developing some postural control and stability in their shoulder muscles. If they're weaker in those muscles, that's going to start helping with that. The next step is to take the tape off the paper and have them use their helper hand, what we call their helper hand, their non-dominant hand, to hold the paper against the wall while they're coloring. That gets that bilateral coordination involved. You can use one inch writing implements. I break crayons all the time. I don't think I ever use full size crayons um, because a little one inch writing implement doesn't allow you to use all your fingers. It'll really help you separate those sides of your hand. One of my soapboxes is really teaching letter and number formation. Schools are not doing that in the curriculum anymore. They're sending home worksheets for tracing, but they're not teaching letter and number formation. Um, children with motor planning difficulties, with fine motor issues, with visual motor issues, really need to be taught how to make their shapes and letters. Otherwise, they're going to come up with inefficient patterns. Um, this is one of those ways that we start talking children through things. If we're making a, a letter, we'll use the same um, motor plan over and over again. We'll use the same words over and over again. We might say big line down, little line across to make an L. Um, handwriting without tears, I think they've changed their name to handwrite. Uh, hand, it used to be called handwriting without tears. Uh, they've changed their name now, but it was developed by an occupational therapist. It's a great multi-sensory way to teach letter and number formation. And they have everything from preschool up to cursive writing. So that's a great tool to use. Oftentimes we use paper with boxes on it. Handwriting Without Tears uses a chalkboard. Um, and this has just boxes with smiley faces that gives us a starting point on where to form our letters. It's a lot easier within a box to make a letter than on a big piece of paper with a line on it. Um, object manipulation games. So we use marbles or tokens or game pieces and we might take two different color marbles and put them in our hand and say, hold the blue one and I want you to push your yellow one all the way up to your baby shark fingers and keep that blue one in your hand. Don't let it escape the cave. And then we might put the yellow one back in and have to move it around in our hand and get the blue one out and see if they can work on that. You can put pennies in a piggy bank. Um, I spy games are great for your scanning, your figure ground, which is finding an object in a busy environment. Where's Waldo is a great one for that. Um, spoon and cup use is great for um, scooping, holding something, pouring with your other hand. And Darcy, um, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but we do have um, we do have two questions. Oh, great. The, the first was at what age should kids stop reversing their letters and numbers? So definitely we, we look at that around six, seven years old. Um, again, I'm finding a lot more reversals now that we're not teaching letter and number formation, that they're not being taught where to start a letter and how to form a letter. Handwriting Without Tears um, teaches a magic C, which is really great um, for teaching letter formation. Um, but we really, by six or seven, should see the reversals have have pretty much disappeared, or that they can really recognize it and self-correct. Gotcha. And then um, one others. Um, 
We have a four-year-old who sucks the collar of a shirt and licks and sucks his lips so that his that they're chapped and it looks like he's been drinking red Kool-Aid. Um, also puts fingers and pencils in his mouth. The kids at school are starting to notice. Is there any um, suggestions you have on ways that a parent can work with their child? Absolutely. There are so many tools out there for oral seekers, which is what this sounds like. Um, so. Um, Talk Tools and ARC have a lot of resources out there. If you look up online, um, oral teething um, tools, you'll find a ton of different things. A lot of time they're vibration tools that will, again, get that proprioceptive input. Um, there are definitely questions I would ask, um, and I don't wanna give medical advice online, but uh, you wanna look at if you're chewing or sucking, cause that might, um, lean me towards different items um, that I would recommend. Um, but there, and there are also different exercises that an OT might give you to work on at home that might provide that input throughout the day. So they might not need to suck on their clothes as much. Um, but there's, there are a ton of different tools out there to help with that. It's so hard in the winter time, and especially with wearing masks, we're finding a lot of kids getting irritated around the lips um, if they're they're constantly licking and sucking them. So that's a real tough one, um, especially as a parent to see and to work on. Um, but there there's definitely tools out there and some exercises out there that you could be given. Wonderful, thank you. Sure, I know. Oh, um, sorry, actually follow up question. Should, um, yeah. should the parent come in for an OT eval then? Um, so let me get back to that question. We're gonna talk about when it's appropriate to refer. So um, hopefully I'll answer that question later. And if you have a follow up, please ask, okay? I'm Thank gonna check through social skills and then um, I think that's my last section because I know we're running towards eight o'clock and I know you guys are probably at bedtime. So <laughs> I wanna make sure I get these done. Um, so social skills, we all know what that is. It's our ability to interact with others in an appropriate manner. We have to have appropriate sensory and emotional regulation to do that. Executive functioning, which are higher cognitive skills, um, flexibility and adaptation, and the ability to interpret others' social skills, or social cues, excuse me. So some red flags, I think we all can kind of know when there are some social skill red flags, but difficulty maintaining personal space boundaries. Now, right now, I think kids kind of have a really good grasp on that. We've all been social distancing for a year, um, but sometimes that's really hard for kids with social skill issues is they're all over other people and they don't know how to maintain that personal space. Difficulty following directions, difficulty with eye contact, Difficulty creating imaginative play or engaging in pretend play. Rigidity or controlling play schemes. Um, you might see a lot of isolated or parallel play versus interactive and collaborative play. Inability to sequence, act, sequence, ugh, sequence activities <laughs> might lead to some social skill challenges. Impulsivity can certainly impact social skills if we can't um, control our body and we may be knocking into towers that our friends are building or we may um, jump into an activity before our friends are ready or take the pieces from our friend and they might want to be the red piece and I just grabbed the red piece. Um, and difficulty transition with transitions or changes in routine can be red flags for social skill issues. So some ideas for social skills um, that you can immediately work on at home are really having high affect in your play. A lot of adults that are in corporate worlds, maybe are in offices all day or in government down here in the DC area, you know, they may have forgotten how to play, you know. Think about how kids play with each other. And when you're playing with your child and working on social skills, try to be a kid. We don't wanna quiz our children. Children don't ask each other, what does a cow say? They take the cow and they go, moo, <laughs> you know? They don't ask, they don't ask what color is this or what shape is this. They just put the round shape in and they say, oh, there's the circle. So we wanna just interactively play, not quiz the children when we're playing with them. 
for children, if they are having difficulty with bubble space, that they're going back to school and will have to work on social distancing, distancing, teaching bubble space, I often will take a hula hoop or um, a jump rope and make a physical bubble space and teach them that we all have these spaces, even if the hula hoop isn't there anymore. We have an imaginary bubble and we can't go into each other's bubbles without asking. Um, turn taking game, games are great. Pausing in a turn taking game and asking the child, whose turn is it? Or accidentally taking their turn and, and seeing if they can react in a just right way to let you know, oh wait, that was my turn versus having a tantrum or if they lose a game, having an overreaction to that. Children with difficulty making eye contact. This is a really big one. Oftentimes, um, adults with sensory processing disorders or with um, autism will tell you, I can either look at you or I can listen to you, but doing both at the same time is too much information for me. So oftentimes what I will do when I'm helping a child with this is I'll coach them to catch my eyes or check in with me in my face and then they can look away. That tells the, list, the speaker that they're listening, that they're engaged. And as long as they follow through with what was asked of them, we know that they're engaging socially. Um, the OOPS card is a strategy I use to work on changes in routine and transitions. It's something that's like credit card or business size. And it says something like, and you can make up your own thing, OOPS card, oopsies happen and plans have changed. Things are different and rearranged. Think of something that makes you smile. You can be flexible for a little while. And the oopsie card comes into play if there's a substitute teacher or if we have to make an errand, we have to make a stop on the way home that we don't usually make. Kids with cha uh, challenges with transitions and routine have a really hard time with that. So the important thing with the oops card is teaching the oops card and presenting it in a really fun way that has nothing to do with a real change in routine. It might be, we're having cereal for dinner, or mommy's wearing daddy's shirt today, or um, we're going to eat dinner as a picnic on the floor. Fun things. And then to constantly do those fun things and present that oops card, it's an oops card day. And then when something big happens that we really need the oops card for, they know it's not a big deal. It can be fun. It can be relaxed. Daddy's picking you up from school today. I know he doesn't usually, but let's think of something fun we can talk about with daddy on the way home. Visual schedules, again, that can be very helpful for kids with social skill issues. You can give them the steps of what a play date might look like and when it'll be time to transition. And then thoughtful planning of play dates or children at centers is another thing that we can help with when we have a child that might get overstimulated by somebody who is very impulsive, or if they are very impulsive, pairing them up with somebody who might be a little bit more understanding. So lastly, when to seek an evaluation? This question just came up. Um, we really look at if a problem is disrupting a child's function, we mentioned other children are starting to react to them. Is it affecting their self-esteem? Is it affecting their ability to participate in activities or in class? That's when it's appropriate to seek out a, a consultation or an evaluation with an OT. Um, we look at any challenges that are persisting for more than three months and that aren't necessarily related to a change in a life habit or pattern. You know, it's not just because a new sibling was born or we got a new bed or we're toilet training. Um, any muscle related concerns, if your child appears extra floppy or um, loose, if they have difficulty controlling their body or if they're extra tight and can't um, stretch their body, those would be times where you would want to seek out, is this something that I need to be concerned about? Is there something that we can do to help? Um, children that aren't able to complete self-care skills at age-appropriate levels. Children should really be working on independence as young as possible. Toddlers should be helping with dressing and brushing teeth. We want children to learn that independence. I know we have to get out, in the door, out the door in the morning now that we're getting back to school, but certainly working on putting pajamas on after bath time or working on dressing on the weekends so that they can be efficient and can help you on school days. And then 
again, any red flags that are impacting their ability to participate, disrupting others, or causing the family, this is a big one. A lot of times families don't even realize that they have changed their routine or altered the way they do things because of something that happens with their child. Well, I just don't take them out when I go to the store because it's so disruptive. Well, that's disrupting your life. You can't take your child into the community and do errands with them. We can help you with that. So those would then you would seek out an evaluation. So um, I hope that that answered that question. If you have a follow-up, please let me know, or if there are any other questions, I can definitely stick around and answer questions if there are a few others. And Darcy, we do actually have two additional questions. Great. Um, so the first is um, someone has a two-year-old who puts too much food in his mouth. Could he possibly be seeking sensory input? Absolutely. Um, that is something we see very often. It can be it can be seeking sensory input. Um, sometimes children have um, what we call low muscle tone, um, and they put more in their mouth to feel it, to get that proprioceptive and tactile input in their mouth. Um, it could be that they don't know how to move the food in their mouth, and they might just be putting it in their mouth and not chewing it correctly. It can be that they're impulsive and they're just overfilling their mouth and they may need some pacing strategies. So there could be a few different reasons, but um, definitely something that we uh, often see and work on. Um, I would start by, you know, trying to trying to think of strategies, trying to figure out the why behind it. That's something OTs are trained in from the get-go is figuring out the why, um, and then see if you can create strategies. And if not, we could certainly help. Great. And then we have another question um, related to the emotional regulation tools that you discussed, like the stoplight token board. What do you recommend for an almost five-year-old who also has a language delay and struggles with both expressive and receptive language at times? Sure. Um, well, um, if he's in speech therapy, I think it's important to consult with your speech therapist and find out receptively what his level is, um, because certainly we would need the, the prompt that we're using or the visual cue that we're using to meet his receptive needs. Um, so without knowing him, it would be very hard for me to guide you towards one or the other. Um, but I, I definitely think a visual cue would be helpful because it does not require him to use any speech to use it either. Um, we There are all sorts of regulation tools out there. There are regulation meters where you can use a bead and he could slide a bead to where he is um, that day, just right, too much, too little. There are pictures that we could use to say, this is a tool that will help me get my body just right. Um, instead of using his language, if, if that's still developing, he can use nonverbal ways to communicate that. So I think it's important to work with the speech therapist if he's getting speech therapy to establish what would be appropriate for him. Wonderful. And then um, we do have one last question that is um, similar to the, the one we just answered. Um, but is, would you say gagging on gagging on food, would that be part of a sensory issue? There could be a few different reasons for gagging. It could absolutely be a sensory issue. It could be from sense of smell, taste, or texture that could be stimulating the gag, or even vision. Um, sometimes children were gagged just by seeing a food. Um, it can also be motoric. A lot of times children will gag because they don't know how to move food in their mouth so they feel stuck. And a gag is our body's safety response. Um, and I'll often teach this to my older kids that gag, um, that it's to keep our body safe. It doesn't feel good, nobody likes it, but it's keeping us safe so that we don't choke. Um, so it would be really important. That might be something that you really might wanna seek out an evaluation for um, because there's so many different strategies and tools to use to help with gagging. Wonderful. Any last questions? I think that looks looks like it. Is that it, thank Lauren? Thank you guys so much. Yeah, I, it's Darcy, thank you so, so much. This was uh, fantastic. We totally appreciate you sharing all of your experience with us. Thank you so much to everyone that attended as well. We just want to take a minute to remind you, please fill out the surveys. And if you want Act 48 credits, 
Um, that can be obtained through the survey, right, Lauren? Yes, there's a link in the follow-up email that everyone will be receiving. Yes, so, and then also, <laughs> Let us know what else you want information on. And uh, we are trying very hard, especially during these challenging times that we're in to, to provide information to you, to help you with your kids and with your life. So thank you everyone. Darcy, you're the best. <laughs> we love you. And um, we love you guys. <laughs> and thank you to all the parents that have worked so hard with your kids this year. I know above and beyond. So thank you for all the work you guys have put in and here to help if you need help. Yeah, the fact that you're on here at seven o'clock at night, given your schedules just uh, speaks volumes. So thank you everyone, have a good night and we'll talk to you soon. Thank Bye -bye. you everybody.